Hey, welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, March 10th. Good to have you on board, everybody. Today's show is going to be a little, something a little bit different. We're going to talk about this year's D.A.R.E. workshop in San Diego, California. Dare, the D.A.R.E. workshop is something that always happens uh, concurrently with West. So while West is happening, and many of you have been there, thousands of people on the convention center uh, floor, etc., at the same time that that's going on, we have this interesting um, group of JOs and uh, from, from each of the sea services, some mid-grade to senior level enlisted, and some civilians who get together to do some design thinking on hard questions that one of the sea service leaders or sea service chiefs asks or pose, poses to the group. Uh, so this year, it was the turn of the CNO, Admiral Gilday, he had two questions in mind, and we'll get to those in a minute, but I want to introduce a couple of the people that participated in the D.A.R.E. workshop. Uh, so uh, first joining us from um, Norfolk, Virginia, is Lieutenant Andrea Howard, U.S. Navy. She is a uh, frequent pr proceedings contributor. She's a member of our editorial board. She's a submarine officer, Naval Academy graduate, and uh, great to have you uh, with us, Andrea. Andrea. It is such a pleasure to be on with you, Bill. I got to do it a long time ago, it feels like now. And in 2018, for the first time, I contributed to proceedings and chatted with you about tactical nuclear weapons. It was a, a pleasure to represent that nuclear thinking community back then. And it's a pleasure to represent the folks that got to participate in D.A.R.E. this year. Awesome. I've forgotten that you've been on the show before. That was like five years ago with, uh, with Ward. Yeah, terrific. Yes, well, great to have you back. Thank you. Uh, beaming in from Boston is Lieutenant Jackie Kokomore, U.S. Coast Guard. She is the CEO of a soon-to-be-commissioned uh, fast response cutter. Jackie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bill. I'm happy to be here, and I appreciate the invitation, uh, not only to the podcast, but to DARE as well. This is some of my first interactions with the U.S. Naval Institute, so counter to Andrea's experience, I'm just getting my feet wet. I really appreciate it. And, and Jackie, tell our listeners the, the name of the ship that you'll be commissioning, and uh, you're going to be taking her up from the Gulf Coast. Just a little bit about that for a second. Absolutely. Um, the William Sparling will be the 54th of 64 fast response cutters that the Coast Guard is purchasing from Bollinger Shipyard. So a lot of them are already in operations, too, already up here in Boston. I'll be the fifth of six, and we'll spend a little time in Louisiana before the shipyard sells the cutter to the Coast Guard in Key West. And then we'll make that transit up north um, and start operating here in the Coast Guard's first district. Our primary mission is gonna be fisheries enforcement, search and rescue, ports and waterway security. Um, but there's really no limit to what those cutters can do. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're sending us down south to work with um, our colleagues down off the coast of Florida and uh, in the Caribbean as well. Drug interdiction possibly down there. Mm -hmm. Drug and migrant yeah. interdiction. Uh, so I, I, this is one of my editorial comments, and I say this often to as many Navy people as possible, including the CNO out at West, which is that the Coast Guard has uh, several lines of very capable ships being built, hot production lines. These are cool, amazing, capable ships. And uh, I don't understand why the Navy just doesn't throw some money behind some of those, uh, you know, the FRCs. Uh, soon to be the OPCs and, of course, the National Security Cutters, all of which, in my mind, could be upgunned a bit, naval strike missiles, that sort of thing. But that's just me editorializing because, you know, our Navy is not getting big. It's not growing as it should be right now to face the threat that we're, that we're faced with. Um, and our final guest today is Lieutenant Commander Steve Hulse. He is our Coast Guard Fellow at the Naval Institute. So every year, the Coast Guard sends us incredibly um, great officers. And Lieutenant Commander Hulse uh, has been with us since, uh, what, August or September. And he was the commanding officer of one of those fast response cutters based out in Bahrain. So Steve, welcome to the show. Hey, Bill, thank you for having me on and uh, happy to talk about D.A.R.E. Uh, with the group. Yeah, and Steve, um, you got to uh, take your ship, your fast response cutter and, and a, a small flotilla of others and deploy them from the East Coast over to Bahrain, what, a year and a, a year ago, right? Yeah, actually, um, it's a little over a year, a year and a half ago now. 
And uh, it was us. We were 1141 Coast Guard Cutter Charles Malthrop, and we sailed with 1142, the Coast Guard Cutter Robert Goldman. And, uh, yeah, we transited from Key West uh, across the uh, Atlantic to Road to Spain through the Mediterranean, Suez Canal, Red Sea, and uh, all the way around to Bahrain. Amazing. Amazing. So let's just start off by asking um, – a little bit about how you each found out about DARE. I mean, obviously, Steve, you found out of it because you're uh, assigned to the Naval Institute this year, and we always assign our Navy and our and our Coast Guard FEFs to work on DARE and help herd the cats to make it happen. But uh, Andrea and Jackie, how'd you find out about it? I found out through the Naval Institute board, but I had also had a number of peers who've participated in the past and said all of the good things that I've discovered myself this year by participating. But I'll say there, there, there were two reasons that really drew me to the experience. And the first is very similar to what we preach in the submarine force, which is that if you want to do basic skills like submarining, like remaining quiet or wiping down sinks to prevent corrosion or doing all the things you need to do to survive underway, then you have to practice that when you're ashore. And the same type of model of thinking needs to be applied to building those strategic thinkers for the maritime services. You need to exercise those skills. And so DARE was this unique opportunity within the maritime space to do that at a junior level. And then the second piece is just wanting to be able to feed the the deck plate observations that we have up to the highest levels of the chain of command. And again, DARE was this facilitator of, of expressing our ideas to the CNO and getting feedback and doing so in really a cross maritime experience too with professionals from the Coast Guard and the Marine Corps, as well as industry. And so when those opportunities present themselves, it behooves us to snatch them. And it was just fantastic to be able to do so this year. Yeah. So Jackie, before you go, I just want to say uh, to those who, who aren't aware or know much about the DARE process, um, in addition, it, so it, it's an opportunity for the service chief, so coming out of the Coast Guard, coming out of the Marine Corps or CNO, and it rotates every year, to ask a difficult or two difficult questions directly to a group of JOs and, and um, mid to senior grade enlisted and civilians uh, who spend two and a half days brainstorming and coming up with ideas. Uh, and then they get to report out directly to the service chief. There's no filtering. It doesn't go up you know, multiple layers of chain of command and get helped along the way. And so it's a, you know, the CNO is there. In this case, he was there and, and presented the luncheon keynote on the third day of West. And then he went upstairs and talked to the DARE group. So it's uh, it's kind of cool to watch. And I've watched now, I think, uh, five or six of the DARE outbriefs. And it's just incredibly refreshing to see. Uh, so, Jackie, your Coast Guard, how did you get word of it? Well, um I had the pleasure to serve with Steve in Bahrain previously. So his connection to the U.S. Naval Institute um, is, is the reason why I heard about it. But ultimately, he reached out to a lot of my um, peers that served in Bahrain during the RCM timeline. Um, and he was really touting the benefit of DARE and um, the reason why not only having Coasties present is important, but also having Coasties who have worked um, with the Navy, who have had some of that multiple like service experience uh, to participate in this um, in this program. So there were a lot of peers of mine who were offered up the opportunity. A few of us uh, applied and at least two attended myself and uh, Lee Skolson, who is also the CEO of an FRC now in LALB. So nice. my segue into DARE was actually Steve, um, but I think that it really spoke to the group of people we had out in Bahrain um, and meant a lot to us as a group because of our previous experience working with the Navy, a little bit with the Marine Corps too, as, um, but specifically our time out there. Yeah, that's great. Um, I would I would mention uh, that it is actually competitive to get selected for this. So we put the word out, uh, our, our CEO, Admiral Daly, puts the word out in emails to lots of different Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard leaders. So that trickles down. You know, you you guys heard about it, you know, sort of word of mouth, Andrea, through the Naval Institute directly as being part of our ed board and Jackie through the Steve connection. Uh, but what we, what we have, 125, 130 applicants and we select about 60, 65 to, to participate. So there's a there's a quality cut here. Absolutely, Bill. And um, when you factor in that 
you know, the way Admiral Daly really markets this is we want you to give this opportunity to apply to your best. So we're already getting um, a very good group of candidates, even just from the folks that apply. So uh, really, when we start cutting that list down to the 64 that we need to actually participate in DARE, you're getting um, elite level talent from across the sea services and industry. So it was a great group this year. Yeah, and you guys also you you look at making making sure it's it's balanced. It's balanced according to uh, a little bit rank, the different services. So Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard are all represented. There's officer and enlisted. There's men and women. There's minority representation. There's different ratings and ranks and in communities. So submariners and aviators and Marine ground and Coast Guard and so we get it, this is a very disparate you know, diverse group of people who come at different problems from different perspectives and different service mentalities, which is also, I think, an incredible power, uh, you know, powerful ingredient of it. Uh, Steve, you worked very closely uh, with the CNO staff over, you know, in the fall and through January uh, to uh, narrow down the questions that the CNO wanted to ask to the group. So how did that process work? And then what were the final two questions that CNO posed to DARE this year? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the process was was quite interesting. We had to really leverage uh, Vice Admiral Daly, the CEO at USNI, his connections to the team uh, to initially get the request out for questions. And we did provide a little bit of background and some, some information on what we thought was relevant. And um, CNO's team took that and ran with it. And ultimately, they did provide us with some with some questions and they focused on talent management and force design and specifically looking at today's um, podcast, the, uh, the Andrea and Jack, Jackie both worked on force design. And the question, you know, I can read it real quick is introducing new capabilities to the fleet requires us to retire legacy platforms that cannot stay relevant in contested seas. Today, the Navy is challenged to operate, sustain, and modernize the current force within fiscal constraints without approved divestments, which means the Navy must shoulder the long-term, fully burdened costs to retain this existing force structure. Additionally, through a rigorous campaign of learning, we recognize that the Navy needs a more continuous, iterative force design process to focus our modernization efforts and accelerate the capabilities we need to maintain our edge in this critical decade and beyond. The Navy must modernize or it risks falling behind. While prioritizing readiness, what investments or divestments should the Navy make to improve the sea services overall warfighting capability? So that question was ultimately posed by CNO's team. And um, that's, that's really what the uh, folks at DARE and the force design group had to work on. That, that, was, their, that was their mission for three days. Yeah, so that, that question is a bit of a Rubik's Cube, right? You've got modernization, you've got legacy stuff that you need to get rid of to modernize, you've got uh, force design, you've got budget, a bit of, you know, the, the budget constraints there, um, you've got, you know, uh, new technology that you need to bring into the force, you've got the, the balance of capabilities from open ocean, you've got unmanned, there's, oh my God, there's, I mean, that really is, like that's a Rubik's cube. That's a varsity level question that, you know, the op nav staff works on day and night, 360, you know, 365 days a year. So um, Andrea, just talk a little bit about the design thinking process uh, before we get to what your group came up with. I want to hear about, you know, how, what's the methodology that's used at DARE? Um, talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Myers um, because he's the facilitator every year. You know, what would you think about design thinking what did you take away from it that you can apply to the submarine service or any other thing that you're working on? Yes, sir. Well, design thinking is this nonlinear iterative process and the teams use it to, as, as implied, to iterate on these problems and dig deeper and continue to identify root causes for the issues that we identify. And then you'll come up with a solution, test it, flex it, you know, murder board it, so to speak, as we would say in the maritime services and continue to make it better. But really what it coincided with are these wicked problems that the different leaders of these maritime services are identifying. So what are wicked problems? Well, they're problems that are never solved. They're resolved over and over again. 
so that can extend to social problems like the kind of cliche poverty or healthcare that we like to talk about in those contexts, but it also extends to these talent management and force design questions that were posited to us. So other distinguishing features of wicked problems include the fact that there's no definitive formula um, to, to shape them. There's no immediate tests or ultimate tests. And so instead you create solutions with waves of consequences that leave traces. And so therefore it's not as simple as trier and error. There are second and third and fourth order effects all the time. And each of these problems are one of a kind. So even looking at talent management and force design, there, there are some parallels that you can draw, but the solution for each of those is going to be unique. And they're really one of a kind type of problems. So the takeaway that I had was that this design thinking process that was posited to us at DARE perfectly fits into the challenges that we are being told on the deck plate to face and solve and provide feedback on from our force leadership, whether that is in this case, force design or something at like you know, complete control of the water column. Or, so ultimately we can take that skill set that we had at DARE and bring that back to our individual units to better identify the day-to-day -day process issues that we're having in a place like Huntington Ingalls Industries where, you know, my team is constructing a new submarine. And then also for the operational units that are out there that are trying to iterate and continue to make better the really complex problems of absolute sea control from the seabed to space. So I, I should have uh, mentioned when I introduced you that you're the uh, operations officer on the USS New Jersey, one of the newest or, you know, if not the newest Virginia payload module block Four Virginia class submarine, as you said, being constructed now down in uh, at HII. Uh, and so some of the, before we, we started recording this, you know, you were describing some of the wicked problems, if you will, of bringing a new, you know, submarine to life uh, and all the things that, that go into that. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad to hear that you thought the DARE process was sort of applicable, you know, to, to some of those other things that you face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Jackie, can you give us, you know, 30,000 foot perspective? Uh, you know, it was an hour long debrief to the CNO, so we won't go into all of it, but what were some of the things that, that your group told the CNO thought you thought ought to be done with regard to force design? Well, Bill, um, it was really interesting because we had four groups, eight each, who attacked this problem um, on force design, and each group came up with an entirely different solution. So when we picked one member from each group to then converge into our presenting, um, our, our presenters, we had to really mesh four completely different solutions for this problem. And I think that goes to show that our design thinking um, really opened up a lot of ideas that people had on force design for the Navy, the Marine Corps, uh, the Coast Guard and the three combined. So I actually just pulled up um, the design thinking double diamond model because I was looking about at um, how we came up with different problems and then came up with the solutions to our different problems, which was incredible because uh, it spanned every level of this question, the highest um, being the proposal for an office of force design. And that was Andrea's group. So she has a, a really great description for that office of force design. But at the um, highest levels of the Navy, we put junior officers um, and operators in an office where we take the information we're getting from our fleets and funneling it up to the highest powers um, at Navy decision making. And that allows us to get real time information to our decision makers. Um, and that segue is, is what we proposed as the first thing we do. And that creates long-term change in the design thinking model that allows us to continue to adapt uh, the Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps. Um, with that, we talked about the C5 necessities, right? Um, we had one of our members in our group talk about every person on a boat being a damage controlman and the way that our future is going, everyone now has to be um, a cyber security expert, a cyber defender, essentially. Um, so starting to integrate cyber training at every single level to allow our fleets to be the most equipped in the world. Uh, we also talked about investments and divestments and where we could consolidate our um money, power, and personnel into base model structures to allow our technicians to become completely proficient at one ship or one aircraft. And then 
create modular differences to allow us to operate in a different area, say the Pacific or the Atlantic, and then to advance at an industry speed rather than um, the speed of procurement that we see most commonly uh, now in the military. So we, we really attacked it from the top down to the bottom. And each of those ideas came from a different group because our design thinking models brought us to different problems, uh, which shows that there's so much to think about. And the DARE process, getting everybody together at once, helped bring out um, a lot of different unique solutions. Very cool. I'm going to go to uh, Andrea for the next question. Um, so Andrea, the the creation of an office of force design, that was part of the, the presentation that you gave. Uh, and it was interesting to hear that, you know, the recommendation, instead of just a whole bunch of uh, senior officers and senior civilians working in that, that office, your recommendation is, let's get some JOs, let's get some, you know, sort of mid-career people. But also there was a rotational aspect of it, that that would be something that somebody kind of specializes in. Describe that a little bit for me. Absolutely. I'll use our logic train first, which is that war fighting was being defined as the number one priority from our force leaders. And just in the same manner as the force leaders are pushing down war fighting to unit commanders as that priority for execution, we need to do the same with force design. Our little tagline that we use for the CNO is that without the right capabilities being fielded at the speed of relevancy, we will likely lose the next large scale conflict or in the worst case, not even reach it. So we said that in order to build a sustained culture of lowest level force design ownership, that we could establish this office of force design built in the same spirit as N7 that was stood up in 2019, but with a little bit of a different muscle. And, you know, it's fun as a junior officer, I got to say, respectfully, admirals and you are not the right level of, of driving force for this force design. So we made the corollary of E5s being the backbone of the ship and therefore O3s to O5s, like you said, the, the mid-grade folks, those mid-grade officers should be PCS to an office of force design and serve as the slow twitch muscle pushing force design over a longer period of time. However, with them being permanently stationed, there still needed to be that voice and, and vocal piece from the ground feeding up the feedback. So to provide that timely prioritized contextualized messaging to the joint chiefs of staff and to those folks in the Office of Force Design, we said that we could have sailors or Marines at that unit or battalion level who could then have a Force Design AQD or collateral duty and and utilize that as a means to provide the deck plate most up-to-date information on what the needs are of the services for both short-term and long-term force, force design priorities. So, you know, lots of articles and things about force design and, and also about acquisition, particularly acquisition problems and challenges and failures uh, that show up in proceedings. And, and you mentioned, you know, this uh, idea of a, a group, a cabal, if you will, of uh, O3s to O5s with that, you know, providing that, that, uh, that long, what did you call it? Slow, slow twitch uh, pressure. Um, one of the things I often hear about the problems with, with force design and how we got where we are in, in case of a lot of, um, you know, programs that kind of went bad is that there's sort of a disconnect between the acquisition community in the services and then the operational community. And sometimes they don't communicate all that well together. So did, did your recommendation, did your group address that or talk about that? Or, or do you think that what you came up with, what you offered, you know, might help fix that problem? We were hoping that the folks in this Office of Force Design would help inform that PPB process and maybe even be the folks who could then circumvent it in some ways. And so the person who really helped us flesh out this idea was that industry post-served Marine in our cohort at West who was able to provide that context for us and for the junior folks in the room who haven't directly interfaced with that process in order to understand what the relationship would be between the Office of Force Design and the people doing that conventional PPB process. So yes, it would inform it, but hopefully it could also provide that timely feedback to the Joint Chiefs of Staff so that in really dire instances, it could even be circumvented. 
And uh, Jackie, how did so? So you, as a Coast Guard person, got to brief the CNO. How did he receive the briefing? What were what was his reaction to it? From what I saw, the CNO was extremely interested in what we had to present and extremely receptive of the ideas, specifically the Office of Force Design. But even going further into uh, the smaller items that we addressed, he was interested to hear about how um, our knowledge, mine specifically about the Coast Guard fleet and then Andrea's specifically about the submarine fleet worked into how force design um, could be made smaller and more efficient to make the Navy, Coast Guard and Marine Corps larger and more efficient, if that makes any sense. Um, sure. Because we have spent so much money on new procurement and we've seen failures. Um, and then being able to kind of draw back see where our known success is, and then move forward uh, creating a standard that allows our sailors and our Marines to really perform at the highest capability that they can first. Um, and that's going to subsequently allow us to operate the, to our highest ability um, at the larger levels. And so the Office of Force Design really encompasses all of that because it allows those uh, middle grade officers to operate in the fleet, come back, tell um, the higher level officers how it's working, how it's not working, and what platforms are really, really difficult to incorporate into our operations, and then come back. And I think um, my experience as a Coast Guard uh, member who has also served over in Bahrain, who has a little bit of experience with the Navy, was valued in the sense that, that we did see um, some awesome successes but we identified a lot of uh, surface level issues that when addressed could make the Navy um, and all of our surface forces um, really operate smoother in the grand scheme of things. Uh, Steve, back to you for a question. I uh, wanna ask um, uh, from your perspective, you weren't part of DARE, you were sort of helping to facilitate it. Um, uh, you know, what, what did you think went well? What did you think, um, you know, we could do better next year? And also what's next in terms of, you know, a, a report out to CNO, um, you know, what have, what are the next steps to hopefully get CNO and OPNAV to take some action on these ideas that were presented? Yeah, so overall, I do think that DARE went pretty well this year. Um, again, the, the groups uh, seemed to work really well together. They were, um, you can tell the enthusiasm uh, the third day there's a, when they do present the CNO um, historically, we only had the presenters in there, but feedback from previous years said that folks wanted to see how the presentations went. So we actually set up the room to allow those folks to attend and it was completely optional and just about everybody attended. So um, rather than head out early, head home early, folks, folks stuck around and came back to, to watch the brief. And um, it was really interesting being in there because we only had an hour with CNO and um, CNO was so engaged that he actually started asking questions from folks beyond just the presenters. He was asking the entire group and uh, time was quickly ticking by and not everybody had made it through their briefs yet. And I was starting to get, I was starting to get worried and his aide was uh, getting ready to, to cut things off. And, and he ended up uh, saying uh, that he wanted to stick around and um, spent an extra 30 minutes with us. Everybody finished their briefs. So I thought that went really well. Um, I do think, there is some room for improvement at DARE, and one of those um, areas is the group that we can get together. So we had pretty low um, numbers of Marines apply. Um, mm -hmm. I mentioned that you know we had over almost 130 applications, so we could only take um, 64, and we accepted just about every Marine that applied because we had so few that actually um, that actually applied. And another area that we'd like to have more representation is industry. We had very few industry folks and, and many of the ones we did have were actually um, either prior service or current reserves, which are also great to have, but it would be nice to have them in addition to some more folks just with experience in industry because um, the, the few that we did have, we had a couple from USAA and uh, they did provide a lot of interesting ideas from the civilian sector that a lot of folks that are currently serving um, might not have ever actually worked or been in the civilian sector, at least beyond very entry-level jobs before they entered the service. So those are two areas 
where I think we could improve. And then uh, the last part of your question, uh, what's next? Well, we're working on a proceedings article that'll go out soon, kind of highlighting some of the issues that were covered. And um, CNO specifically requested a video of all of the presenters at DARE. So um, Bill, thank you for, for being there at DARE uh, on the spot with a video camera and mics ready to go. And we set that up, we did videotape all the presentations and those videos are going to be submitted to CNO very soon for their review. Separate from the podcast. Separate from the podcast, yes. Um, and, um, and, the, and really what that's gonna do is allow CNO to, to review that and, and take some of those for action. And if you look at previous years, dares and some of the um, ideas that were posed to the service chief, some of those have actually made it um, into policy. And, and one good example is the Coast Guard this year started a policy where officers can opt out of um, promotion potentially um, with, a, uh, with a waiver request. Um, and uh, that was an idea that was originally presented at DARE in 2021. So it took almost two years to, uh, to make it, uh, which I guess is the speed at which policy typically works, but it is an example of um, a positive outcome coming from DARE. Yeah, exactly. And, and as, as I mentioned, I've been there for, I think, about five of these outbriefs. And, you know, sometimes you can see that, you know, the, the General Nell, the former commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, people often joke that there were like, you know, the six faces of Neller. And it was, you know, happy, sad, mad. And they were all like, that was Neller, right? That was his. Um, but I remember uh, him sitting across from a, a lieutenant, Navy Lieutenant J.G., uh, who was going to talk to him about, you know, essentially combat effectiveness of the Marine Corps. And I could tell that he was like, what's this skinny little Navy JG going to tell me? And then Daniel Stephanus started the brief and it was like, you know, Neller's like starts taking notes. He's looking at his staff. Are you guys getting this? You know, so it, it's really, it's exciting to see, you know, a group of junior to mid-grade people get that opportunity to talk directly uh, to a service chief, uh, particularly on a question that they've that they've posed to that group, so it's it's kind of fun to watch. Um, so we're about out of time. I just want to give each of you uh, time for any saved rounds. Last last parting thoughts, Andrea. Yeah, thank you again for having us, Bill. For me, Dare was what I'd call my first joint experience, and that's even in the absence of some of our our fellow services being represented. But having not done JPME, I really enjoyed the chance to understand our collective weak areas of interoperability, but also the strength of tackling problems like those wicked problems that are posited to us together. And then it was just a privilege to have the direct feedback on the barriers of institutional change from the person who's trying to lead those institutional changes from the CNO and to also then see his receptiveness. Um, so. I can't recommend the experience enough to anybody who is considering applying in the future. And again, I cannot recommend the Naval Institute enough to folks that are trying to find some of that professional fulfillment outside of their day-to-day -day jobs. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Jackie. Echoing what Andrea said, um, my experience at DARE was Absolutely positive and an incredible time um, to work with members of the Navy and the Marine Corps who I otherwise wouldn't have had an opportunity uh, to network with, to talk with and share ideas with. Even having been in Bahrain, um, being underway was a completely different experience. Uh, this was a forum that was just meant for our ideas and our experiences to be put onto paper so that we could uh, see how to operate better. Additionally, here in the Coast Guard's first district, this has gotten a lot of pickup because they were really excited for me to attend there uh, mm -hmm. so that we had some representation from a part of the Coast Guard that is not always working with our other um, maritime forces. So um, the captain here at Sector and the captain at, at District 1 and the Admiral, they've all been briefed on my attendance of DARE. I gave them a, a really long uh out brief on, on kind of how we operated things and, and what the outcome was. And they're excited to listen to this podcast as well. So I'm happy to say that this has gotten a lot of attention um, in my small community of work. And uh, everybody is really happy to start sending more JOs to DARE next year and to start really 
um, getting the Coast Guard involved at every single level because it was an incredible experience. Cool. Well, Jackie, you should keep in mind the uh, Federal Executive Fellowship at the Naval Institute for after <laughs> you've had command, you make lieutenant commander and you're looking for uh, a year of shore duty. Hope We, we hope that you'll be one of the future uh, FEFs uh, at the Naval Institute. Steve, any parting, parting rounds, parting shots? Bill, I will say that my year so far as the Federal Executive Fellow at the Naval Institute has been uh, tremendous. I've learned so much. It was an honor to, uh, to get to work on DARE and help plan that event. I have to give a shout out to uh, Commander Stiles Hurd. He's not here right now. He also um, is dual hat fellow at CSIS and, and he's uh, uh, on a trip right now to Africa. Um, and also I wanna give a shout out to the events team at USNI, um, they do a lot of a lot of hard work in the background, setting up events like West and Dare, and uh, many others that that the institute does throughout the year, and and they really do work hard, and it was uh, great to work with them as well. So just thanks all around, and um, looking forward to Dare next year, and I know the next uh, Coast Guard fellow and the next Navy fellow will run with it and, and make it even better. That's cool. Yeah, uh, shout out to April Perico. She's the director of our events and conferences. And uh, she has a team of two and a half full-time employees and they run West. They run our maritime security dialogues. They run events that happen in the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. They run DARE. It, it's amazing what they get done with a very, very, very small team. So good point. I'd also like to thank uh, USAA, uh, which is the company that sponsors DARE. So there's a lot of costs like hotel costs, travel costs for participants, uh, food while they're there, incidentals, rental of the space at the convention center and USAA chips in and contributes to that every year. Uh, and we really appreciate their sponsor sponsorship. So uh, unfortunately that wraps up another episode of the podcast brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute since 1873, bringing an independent open forum for the advancement of sea power. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. Until next week, remember, Victory begins at the Naval Institute.